Osprey. Yeah, so there's a Cal Osprey workshop on April 12th. I think I got that right. And it's about detection and recovery of floating oil in, in where it's uh, site compromised, right? Night or in fog. So the, de the details of that will be posted on the OSPR website. So anybody who's interested in that can go to that, go to that website. Okay, uh, so Tim, should we start? Yeah, let's go ahead, Lynn. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our always very response knowledge transfer webinar. And uh, we hosted uh, uh, five webinars last year, and this is uh, the first one uh, in uh, 2022. <laughs> so welcome. And also, Happy New Year. This is the uh, first day of Chinese Lunar Year. <laughs> so, um, so first thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, we are going to record record the whole webinar session uh, uh, with the uh, you know video and 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 also audio. So, um, so if uh, you don't want to be announced by your name, you can uh, send out questions uh, uh, anonymously, and uh, uh, we also. Uh, post the, the recordings uh, to a API website. So I included the link in the meeting in white. Uh, we already released the first four webinars. Uh, if you missed out any of them, you can go and check it out. I will uh, try to release uh, the uh, webinar five and this one uh, shortly. And uh, the purpose of uh, the webinar is to uh, give a platform to uh, to allow the very seasoned experts <laughs> from expert to share their knowledge to to the you know less uh, experienced like me, and um, and also give a platform to uh, allow us to share uh, different uh, perspective perspectives and insights. Uh, the webinar we're trying to uh, organize is a monthly basis. So um, we held the, the webinar every first Tuesday of the month. Uh, and it's uh, like one hour and 15 minutes from 10 a.m. start from 10 a.m. U.S. Houston time. Uh, we're still trying to find uh, uh, suitable uh, speakers uh, for next month. And if we cannot find one, we may uh, skip uh, March, but uh, if we can find one quickly, uh, I will send up the invite for the next webinar uh, quickly. Uh, so the format for the talk is uh, we'll uh, give the speaker one hour to speak and then uh, about 15 minutes of our questions and the questions can only be uh, sent out through Q&A button. We'll go through the Q&As and if uh, we pass the, uh, the schedule, the webinar time uh, as before we just uh, continue uh, going through those questions and if you uh, like to stay we welcome to stay with us um, and uh, I think uh, that's all I need to uh, uh, to to announce and uh, and next uh, my uh, my colleague Tim Nightwatt will introduce our our speaker uh, Chris Reddy Tim yeah Okay, yeah. thank, thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, first I want to thank Chris for taking the time because I know this isn't just something you wake up and give a presentation like this and he's given a lot of thought to this. So I appreciate taking the time to do that, Chris. But a lot of people know Chris Reddy, but he's been um, working at Woodson Soul Institute um, for a long time and has a lot of experience on both the response side with that understanding, but also on the research side of oil spill response. So you can see the title of his slide it's up on the screen. So he's gonna share his experiences and lessons learned in oil spill response from more of an academic perspective. But I think Chris is, uh, is one of these uh, academics who certainly understands the, the response side of things. So he's a senior scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and studies marine pollution, marine, sorry, marine, marine pollution, petroleum geochemistry and develops natural products for the cosmetics industry. When the Deepwater Horizon disaster occurred in 2010, uh, Chris pivoted to focus much of his research on this spill. He spent nearly a decade tracing nature's response to the thousands of chemical compounds released uh, to determine what biological, what biodegraded and, and evaporated, and what is still present in the Gulf of Mexico. Chris has extensive experience communicating science to the media, policymakers, and the public, 
He has written nearly 20 opinion pieces, which is kind of phenomenal. Tested, he's testified before Congress and Senate five times and given hundreds of interviews. In 2014, he was honored with the prestigious International C.C. Patterson Award for leading an innovative breakthrough of fundamental significance in environmental geochemistry, particularly in service society. More recently, he was honored as a 2018 fellow in the American Geophysical Union bestowed with their ambassador award. Um, I've known Chris for, gosh, at least 10 years now. I think we first met at a NOAA workshop that, that Nancy Kent held, um, gosh, I can't remember when it was, around 2010 or so. Um, but what strikes me with, with Chris is that he has a uh, perspective that's, that's not just an academic perspective. And what, what I remember is the presentation Chris you gave at, uh, at the National Academies on the dispersion study. And one of the things that's, that I've known for a long time is that oil spill response and decision making is not an objective science, right? Perceptions very often rule the day. And so what you argued at that National Academy things, which always really impressed me, is that there's a need to understand the psychology of oil spill, oil spill response because uh, people's impressions can change things and not necessarily in the right, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn over things to, to Chris, and I think he's going to go through some of those issues in this talk. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, th hey, thanks a lot, for, uh, Lynn and uh, Tim, for inviting me. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be talking science amongst a lot of snow where I live. So, uh, um, but let me just jump in. Um, notably, I'm not going to talk about Deepwater Horizon. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, moments in my life in 2003 and uh, bring us up to something in the last uh, six or seven months. So uh, my talk is mainly about my perspective about academia and oil spills, but uh, I suspect there's some lessons learned for all of us, uh, not only academics, but how um, the response community and the media and other stakeholders um, think about uh, academia, maybe what they don't think and what they should think about. Um, let's see. Ah. So, you know, as much as I study oil spills, I'm much more interested in about how nature responds to these uninvited gas, to these pollutants, and taking that knowledge gained and trying to figure out how you can make next generation materials and products. Um, so it's a compound that doesn't break down. Why does it not break down? Can we take advantage of that toughness or lack thereof um, and think about it and making next generation uh, materials? Um, Oil spills to me are fascinating because there's such a diverse group of uh, chemicals. And um, some point early in my career, I noticed that uh, um, the action where a lot was going on uh, during an oil spill was in the first hours and days. And so I, I started to get really interested in studying oil spills um, early on because the processes, a lot of processes were happening and they were happening fast. And uh, so that's how I started um, studying oil spills we study oil spills early on, we start getting involved with the response, and um, this is where I'll be uh, talking about for the rest of the day. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two experiences, uh, bookended. Um, the Bouchard 120 oil spill, which happened in 2003, right here in Buzzards Bay, where I'm, where I'm at, um, and then some work uh, in Sri Lanka that I'm ongoing on this uh, cargo vessel called the Express Pearl, which caught fire last May 2021. And released a diverse group of uh, chemicals and uh, the work that I've done in that, that kind of response arena. Um, so I just got to talk about how badly I performed from a response community's perspective working on the Bouchard 120 and uh, how I learned about different cultures and different roles um, after that spill and how that uh, what happened during the 2003 spill really prime me for the rest of my career, even though it wasn't a very big spill. And then I'm going to take those lessons that I learned and, and, and think about, thought about them the whole time I was helping out uh, in Sri Lanka, the other side of the world. So 2000, first day of class and uh, the Express Pearl, which happened still ongoing per se, uh, is kind of my senior project. Oh no. Uh, so, um, my internet says it's being a little hinky. That's why I got scared. So, yeah, I mean, if you leave right now, if you could just hang in there, one thing I learned is first impressions can be wrong. Uh, that um, talking to people over coffee is way better than email. 
that a successful outcome, both in oil spills and I guess in life, is to understand and respect the other uh, folks who you're going to interact with. Um, you know, people always say, oh, know your audience. I, I don't think that's the right point. I think it's more like have coffee with your audience and, and appreciate their, their lives and what they need. Um, later on, I'm going to talk about plastics and that uh, this ship, the Express Pearl, spilled a lot of plastic. And I think studying plastics is very hard. Studying uh, plastics that, that got burnt on, on the ship uh, makes it even harder. And I think that the Express Pearl uh, sheds light on uh, the challenges that we face uh, with the backup of cargo vessels right now. And that um, the contain, the, what's on these cargo vessels is much more diverse and, and, uh, and uh, you know, ever changing. And I think it puts a lot of challenges in place. Although I think our knowledge from oil spills uh, makes us uh, well ready to respond, almost, I would say, pre-adapted. So I was a, I've always been kind of bratty, but I would say I was particularly bratty and naive and full of myself in, in January 2003. Because I once said to somebody, uh, when there's an oil spill, people call me. And the funny thing is a friend of mine heard me say that, and she reminds me that I say that all the time. And um, it was said very obnoxious and um, kind of cocky. And, you know, I, I had the right to say that because I've studied, I studied two oil spills. So I certainly was an expert at that time. <clears throat> my PhD, part of my PhD, I studied the North Cape oil spill uh, off the, along the coast of Rhode Island. And that was a, a, a mixture of diesel fuel and home heating fuel oil. Um, and I worked on that and, you know, made some insights and uh, got, got myself on the front page of the newspaper. And uh, certainly it ballooned my uh, ego, uh, although I, I think it was good science. And then once I came to, I did my PhD at the University of Rhode Island. And then when I came to uh, work on my postdoc at, at, at Woods Hole Geographic, um, John Farrington uh, had said, well, why don't you go and check out the, whether or not there's any oil remaining um, from the 1969 uh, West Falmouth spill. So or sometimes it's called, the, the, the barge was the Florida. Um, he, you know, the last time they had been out there was about 10 years ago, after um, 10 years earlier. He said, you should go check out if there's any oil still remaining. So um, John has always had great advice, and I went out there. And um, started about a decade of work going back and revisiting this oil spill. It's a, you know, it's a living laboratory. And the first paper that I published on that uh, went back. We looked at some salt marsh cores. You can see I published this paper in 2002, about the fall of 2002. We nicely showed that in the salt marshes that around uh, you know, 15 centimeters below the surface, there was still oil. Um, it was you know, heavily degraded diesel fuel. Um, and then below it wasn't. And, uh, I, and then after that, I kind of riffed off and thought about new technologies that you could use to study this remnant oil. Uh, and I got a lot of press. Uh, a lot of people were fascinating. And of course they ran with the idea that oil lasts forever. Despite my, I will say, my hard-earned efforts to remind people that it wasn't a lot of oil there and that it was a, a living laboratory, but you know, you can't control the press sometimes. And they made it pretty dire sounding. And uh, I don't think that made a lot of people happy with me despite my best efforts not to. Um, so five, six months later, um, after the West Falmouth spill came out, which I shed that oil can last for 40 years in distinct areas, there's another oil spill, the Bouchard 120. In this case, it was carrying uh, number six or, or bunker fuel oil. It was uh, going up uh, Long Buzzards Bay. It was going to drop off oil at a, at a power plant, uh, maybe like 20 miles away from here, from there. And um, it was a Sunday night in April, and it, and it released uh, you know, some pretty sticky... Uh, oil. And um, I was out there pretty quickly with my buddy, Bob Nelson, and we, we got a boat ride. Uh, I would say that we were, I heard about it early Monday morning. I would say that we were collecting samples Monday morning, maybe by 11 a.m. So, um, you know, maybe 18 hours after oil got released, we were collecting field samples. Uh, that was on a Monday. We were collecting the samples. We were going back to lab, analyzing them. And uh, that's what we were doing every day. Um, I know I did some press interviews. 
uh, and was communicating with um, the local NGO um, non-governmental organization, the Coalition for Buzzards Bay. Uh, so maybe on the um, Thursday, so four or five days later, I was invited uh, to give a talk, um, kind of a big town hall meeting in New Bedford, uh, which is on the other side of Buzzards Bay, to talk about the oil spill. It was a big deal locally. Um, and I finally got that phone call. That phone call that I said, you know, uh, when I was so boasting about my greatness, uh, I got the phone call. And it was the Friday before, uh, the day before this uh, seminar I was supposed to give. And it was from a, a very talented, and I, I have tremendous respect for um, kind of oil spill scientists. We'll leave it at that. And um, this person reminded me that the Bouchard 120, this ongoing event, was not another West Falmouth spill. This person wanted me to be very clear that when I spoke tomorrow, that if I brought up the West Falmouth spill, that I needed to be very careful not to say the Bouchard 20 was another spill. Um, I was pretty, I was not happy that I was getting a phone call from somebody in the oil spill community uh, that was trying to censor me the day before a meeting. Uh, although now I totally appreciate uh, that effort and, I and I'm very good friends with that person. So uh, I'm okay with it, but I can tell you that day before, somebody telling me what I can and cannot speak about uh, drove me nuts. I was so mad. Um, anyways, next day I, I show up at this, um, the New Bedford Whaling Museum, it was a really pretty place and it was packed. And it was packed with a really diverse audience. People in the response community, lay public, they wanna know whether or not they should be selling their houses, uh, media, you know, business folks, the government, there was some academics there, non-government organizations. There was a, a guy who was a fisher who was, you know, people were trying to figure out whether or not they can start fishing and, and uh, feeding their family. Uh, what I've learned now is that giving talks to diverse audiences as a scientist is about as hard as it gets. You know, it's very tricky uh, because each one of these folks uh, has a different interest and, and wants and desire. And that's an ongoing theme in this talk is that the, the more diverse your audience as a scientist or any person, the trickier it gets. Um, because everybody has a different interest and a, a different uh, uh, means of communicating and what they define as success. So I don't know whether or not um, there was a speaker either before or after me, but I will know, I will say that I came in a pressed blue suit. I knew I had shaved. And it's funny, I actually thought that morning when I was leaving my house, can I look good? And I remember talking to myself and looking at my PowerPoint deck and say, well, this is such a pretty deck. And uh, I was very, very confident. Um, and either you speak or right before me or right after me, uh, who I immediately coined uh, Rumpel Jeans. And it was this guy who came up and he, you know, he looked like he just rolled out of bed. Um, and he gave the worst talk. Uh, it literally was still with overhead slides. And the over sli overhead slides looked like they were made before I was born. Um, he was not happy to be there. He was kind of reluctantly giving this presentation. And I, I almost, I thought he was annoyed. Uh, and at one point he kind of held out this small little kind of um, field guide that, um, that Noah must have used for oil spills. And he kind of held it there and he said, well, this is what we use. And he didn't say anything about the Bouchard 120. And you know, as an audience member, and I think a lot of folks in the audience, they really wanted to hear about the spill, whereas this person really talked about the process. Um, I, I was totally unimpressed. And uh, was kind of like, oh my gosh, this guy doesn't even look good. His slide looks terrible. Uh, it doesn't even want to be there. And uh, on my side, I gave the most prettiest talk ever and was talking about this new technology called comprehensive two-dimensional gas chromatography. And this is a chromatogram of the oil, one of the first samples we collected. And I showed this diverse audience, these unbelievable you know, chromatograms. And I was really driving home to the fact that the separation was unbelievable. Like, you know, we were separating compounds that always would have co-alluded. I mean, honestly, I was thinking like that. 
you know, that <clears throat> like chromatography was spectacular. It was getting tremendous resolution. Um, <clears throat> it was, and um, I remember either thinking or kind of, you know, there isn't a videotape of that talk, uh, but I can tell you what my mindset was, is that I told that audience that I thought that with the technology that we had and the, the lessons that we learned scientifically, how to approach oil spills from the West Falmouth spill. So I thought that we were gonna, we were on the precipice of trying to get the most, the most advanced uh, weathering profile. I told the audience that, or uh, that I was well positioned to disentangle uh, losses of evaporation versus water washing. You know, that often is difficult to uh, apportion because same compounds can be acted upon by both processes. And then I was like, and we can even do something cooler we can actually show that if the microbes are eating the oil, you know, we can see that carbon that they're eating in their biomass. And uh, which is, you know, I was super excited. And I gave this presentation and uh, I thought it went great. And, you know, what I predicted and what I thought I, I was going to do, I actually did. Uh, that first part number one, we published a paper in 2006. So three years later, start talking about weathering profiles. Number two, talking about disentangling evaporation and water washing. Uh, first paper came out in three years later. Uh, you know, one, uh, one a big paper, got the cover of analytical chemistry. Uh, we came back with uh, um, two papers written by my um, postdoc at the time, Sam Airy, which are toward spectacular papers. Um, published in 2007, back-to-back -back papers. Then, um, then we, we were able to show that the carbon, that some of the microbes were actually eating the carbon and we could show that it was happening. We were tracing the carbon that was in there with a natural tracer, not like a radioactive tracer. <clears throat> well, naturally produced. And uh, we published the first paper there in 2006. So what I said I was gonna do in May, 2003, I delivered three to four years later. And I remember leaving and driving home and thinking that that was the greatest presentation I've ever given. Um, 18 years later, it was an F, uh, total bomb. <laughs> Just the worst talk ever. Uh, I failed. You know, I'm pretty sure that I left that audience hungry. Um, you know, I gave them gourmet food. Um, I think they just wanted uh, comfort food. You know, um, I was talking about that. I was going to bring them to some uh, uh, Cordon Bleu restaurant with a, but you had to wait three years um, for a reservation. And um, I'm pretty sure that most of those folks in that audience would have been happy with a Coke and a hot dog. It's not to say they didn't have a, a, a refined palate, but that's what they needed at that time. You know, they didn't want to wait. They didn't understand that at that time. Um, I didn't ask what anybody wanted me to talk about. Um, I just gave a talk about what I thought was interesting, not necessarily what other folks would be thinking about. Um, nobody told me what to talk about, although I was told not to talk about. Um, Rumpel Jeans with Steve Lehman, who uh, just recently retired um, um, for NOAA as a scientific support coordinator. Um, again, it was like the worst talk ever. Uh, in my mind, 2003, uh, I think now, you know, uh, um, you know, basically he didn't want to be there in part because he hadn't slept. You know, he had just left the Unified Command. Uh, you know, he had bigger issues to, to do than... Um, going to a town hall meeting. Um, maybe like, uh, so about a week later, uh, and I was talking to the press, I was still doing work there. Um, Steve started to send emails back and forth with me. And one of them started out with, you're getting a lot of FaceTime on the news. If you read the rest of these emails, it was clear that he wasn't happy with me. Um, he was uh, um, having demands of me. He wanted me to share my data. He had heard that I was talking to somebody who did cleanup. He was reminding me all the rules. Uh, I will tell you that the emails were not very friendly. 
They weren't very inviting. Of course, they were coming via email. Uh, I walked away in 2003. But the thing was, too, I wasn't really worried. Uh, Steve Lehman was not going to make a decision with my tenure file. Uh, he didn't have any way. He wasn't going to review any of my papers. And it, wasn't, it was clear that he wasn't going to provide any funding for me. So tenure papers and funding, you know, if you don't touch upon that, I wasn't worried. Uh, I was annoyed because my ego was a little upset and I was frustrated that this guy didn't understand me. Uh, but that was it. But um, we left um, the Bush I-120 and things go on. And I ended up working a little bit on the Costco Busan early on. And then one of my graduate students worked on the Costco Busan oil spill, which also was a, a bunker fuel uh, that spilled in San Francisco Bay. Um, I wrote a little piece about this and also annoyed Steve then. So I had followed up annoying Steve from 2003 into 2007. And along the way, from this period, from like 2003, you know, up to about 2009, I know that I had said in front of my really close friend, uh, who's a fantastic chemist, who also was, uh, was Rick Gaines uh, at the Coast Guard, who was at that time teaching at the Coast Guard Academy, but he had spent time in uh, the response community, oil spill response, a tremendous chemist. And twice, somehow or another, Lehman's name came up. And the second time I said something like, ugh, guy gives the worst talk, he was you know, nasty to me. Uh, Rick stopped the conversation and yelled at me. And he's a real gentleman. And he reminded me that, you know, that um, if, you have, if you owned your own island and you had an oil spill, you'd be begging Steve Lehman to come help you. Uh, and he had told me that I, I completely didn't understand Steve Lehman and that I was completely wrong about my thoughts about him. So that was maybe, I don't know the second time he said, you know, he really spoke to me. I would say that was probably 2007, 2008 as well. And uh, by chance, I, Nancy Kinner had uh, invited me to this workshop uh, about one year before Deepwater Horizon. And it was a fantastic workshop uh, with a lot of oil spill folks there. And in fact, if you looked at the attendance log of the folks there one year, before Deepwater, uh, it was just about every player was there. And I'm not, I can't remember exactly who arranged uh, that Steve and I would meet and have a beer before dinner. And I don't, I don't, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Steve. Uh, but either way, uh, Steve and I hung out um, for maybe an hour. And uh, it was great. And you know, Steve is not a diplomat. God bless him. And I love him to death, by the way. Uh, he, I think his first, you know, after his first sip of his beer, he, he reminded, he told me that I was a guerrilla geochemist. His point was is that uh, I was an academic uh, geochemist who would, would be making some measurements and, you know, taking these little pot shots uh, while he was at the response, the unified command. And that, um, you know, I was annoying and I was frustrating um, so that was his opening salvo. <laughs> but he wasn't doing that well. Um, but then he spoke to me and he said, you know, we talked for a long time. And this is just one piece of this conversation. He said, every time you talk to the press, you make my job harder at the Unified Command. And then he said, here's why. And he explained to me that if I said something to the press, whether it was accurate or not, that uh, it would most likely be amplified. And then uh, he would be charged, or somebody at the Unified Command would be charged to you know, think about a respond to that for whether or not it was from a, a stakeholder, from their bosses. Um, he was clear that he wasn't censoring me. He was just explaining to me that what his job was, what he considered success, and what he needed. Again, he wasn't censoring me. He just basically responded. And, and you know, he was telling me, he was annoyed with me and he was frustrated with me from 2003 because uh, what I was doing in his mind, in the, in the um, Unified Command's mind, was, was acting like a guerrilla geochemist. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, but I get, but it, it dawned on me the things that I had done that, that would have happened. I, I could remember two interviews. Um, it, was a, it was an enlightening experience. Um, that Steve explained to me, and I explained to him a little bit about my world, 
but it was much more of Steve telling me how his world was. And I walked away in Durham, New Hampshire, after having that beer, or, um, drink with him, uh, completely changed and thinking that, uh, that he was great. And, you know, that I've had this uh, kind of this figure uh, throughout my career, last maybe 10, 15 years, thinking about that, um, that when you have an oil spill, it's an intersection of interests. And you have this uh, machinery that starts turning uh, as part of uh, uh, when you have to respond to an oil spill. And, and like it or not, there's a lot of cogs. And uh, to have a smooth response, uh, you know, these, all these cogs have to be somewhat synchronized. And, um, you know, Tim's conversation with me was one of the first aha moments about how different stakeholders, whether they mean it or not, how they could affect the response. And um, it, was, it was a lightning moment in my life. Um, and Steve Lehman went from Rumple Jeans to a really smart, cool guy um, who was candid, who uh, spoke to me, you know, face to face. He didn't sugarcoat it at all, uh, uh, but he was a good guy. And he explained to me in a way that he wasn't talking down to me. Uh, it was great. And um, that experience, one year before Deepwater Horizon, I couldn't cement enough uh, um, supports a statement that Thad Allen uh, said frequently during the Deepwater Horizon uh, that you don't exchange business cards at a crisis, that you don't talk to each other and try to figure out who you are and what your job is and what your role is at a crisis. You do it beforehand. And this was a perfect case study. You know, I was with Steve a year later, a year earlier, and uh, we created a relationship and we began to develop a trust and a mutual respect for each other. That stands very strong now. In fact, I was pretty bummed out that he retired on, on me. Um, I lost the slide. And, you know, um, look, this is a classic case of, of first impressions. This is some quote. If you go and Google, you know, wrong first impressions, there's no shortage of them. Uh, this is the first one that popped up. And think about this as an academic, young academic, who doesn't understand how a response works. Steve Lehman is busy, you know, battle hardened, been there, done that, trying to make a bad thing from getting worse. Uh, let's think about how our first impressions played out. Um, impressions can be wrong because of past experiences, current mood, surroundings, and, ex and, and other experiences. The point is, is that. Um, I developed a, a, a wrong and first impression. It took six years to resolve, um, but it happened. And you know, that's life. Um, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to remind you folks out there and all of us that especially, I think there is a lot of tension often with academia and the response community. Now I'm not telling every academic that they have to uh, do how I do things. Um, they can do whatever they want. But the point of the matter is it's valuable to understand the stakeholder of a response responder or uh, somebody who represents the company that's the responsible spiller, whether it's the media uh, elected folks, they all have a different interest and a goal. When you, uh, when you appreciate their different, uh, how their different cogs run, um, I think it works out better in the long run. During the Deepwater Horizon, at one point I was lucky enough to be invited down uh, in September of 2010 uh, to work at the Unified Command and um, kind of being what I was called an academic liaison. And I had the real treat to sit next to Tim. I mean, not Tim, Tim, I, I wish I did, Tim Nedwood, to sit next to Steve. And Steve and I worked um, shoulder to shoulder. I was there for maybe two weeks. And uh, one day, uh, while we were prepping to give a whole series of briefings to uh, elected officials and, and, and bureaucrats and, and other folks, as we were prepping, um, Steve and I were helping um, Admiral Zunkoff at that time. He was the FOSC. There was a, another scientist who was in the media making some statements about stuff, which the, that person was allowed to do. But those statements uh, found their way into every conversation that day, that uh, people would show up and they'd say, well, what about this? I'm hearing about this in the news. And uh, we didn't know. You know, Steve and I didn't know. Um, 
And at one point, Steve turned to me and he said, and that is guerrilla geochemistry. And um, it, was, it was a very telling moment because I could see exactly what happened. That uh, this person who's a very, very good scientist uh, um, you know, was making a statement um, and that statement found its way into a day long series of briefings uh, with the director of the FDA, um, uh, some local officials and, and other folks there. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a big moment that I actually got to see Steve's words in action. And when you think about academia and the response community, I often think about uh, four things and how we differ. I think we differ a lot in how we, uh, how, what, what's time to us, you know, uh, uh, and how do we un handle uncertainty? You know, like scientists need, you know, my world, you have to be pretty certain. And it takes three years, four years for these papers to come out. Uh, you know, the response community will take some good knowledge in hours if that helps them make the most well-informed decision. Uh, along the way, there, there is a certain amount of risk uh, on every side. And, uh, you know, scientists are not very risky. Uh, we try not to be. And uh, then you have to think about reward. So there is a time component. There's a certainty component. There's a risk component, and then there's a reward component. Uh, what do each different stakeholder have as a reward? Um, you know, my reward, you know, was my tenure file in 2006. So three years later, you know, Steve's reward was he had to do this job because it was his job. And, you know, you can put a lot of these aspects of response in academia and other places on, on risk reward, the time, uh, time play scales, and, uh, uncertainty and certainty and you know by far no means am i going to compare an oil spill to covid uh and i think science has been wrongly treated in a lot of places and i think one of the biggest issues is that folks don't understand how science works it's not the science you don't understand how science works about tenure and things change and all these things and i try to explain to people that uh, you know crises aren't science wasn't built for crises we don't move that fast and if, you know, if science was a sport, it would be baseball. It's very slow, 162 games. Uh, you, know, you know, it, it moves slow, it, you know, it goes back and forth, these little corrections when the team loses and wins. And a lot of the other stakeholders, like it or not, are much more interested in, you know, a very fast paced game of soccer. And I think science has a hard time uh, being uh, the, the, the way in which our culture is. And, and, and what is our, and how we're evaluated and what is considered success for us. So from then on, after the Deepwater Horizon, and I'm not kidding you, um, when I got involved in a response as an academic, I'd often say, uh, if I do this, is Steve gonna be mad at me? Not honestly, uh, you know, there were probably times when I, knew that Steve might be mad, but I thought that it was in the best interest to uh, society or maybe other folks. Um, so by no means was uh, I letting Steve, me trying to make Steve happy, like, you know, I wasn't in the business of pleasing Steve, but I was thinking about whether an action that I was going to do was going to affect the response because it wasn't a game anymore. Like I recognized that this is one thing I learned from Deepwater Horizon is walking these beaches and picking up oil. And you're hearing from people asking when they can feed their family again, that this wasn't just publishing a really cool paper or getting the cover of a journal. It was that what I said and what I did and the science I did um, was, was going to people's bellies and their wallets. And, uh, you know, walking the beaches of Deepwater Horizon was... Uh, another moment in my life about the, the personal connection that when, you, when I got out of the lab and I got out of my office, um, you can learn a lot about um, being a good scientist. And uh, again, this is my personal opinion. You know, scientists can do whatever they want uh, and follow the rules in which they want to. But in my case, it became very clear around 2010 that arguably after every oil spill, the most affected uh, living item, a person, li living being uh, uh, most likely to be injured uh, was, um, and perhaps the, the hardest hit was people. And uh, 
I recognized that what I did and what I said could affect the people and that it wasn't a game anymore. So my takeaways, there's a lot of them. And I mean, there's no shortage of these conversations about um, how we can have, you know, more of a kumbaya. And I'm not discussing, I mean, I shouldn't say kumbaya like that. I'm not discounting them in any ways. I think they're great. Uh, but I can tell you that um, we should not have heart-to-heart -heart conversations or discuss these things with email. Uh, you know, I was super lucky to have Rick Gaines uh, straighten me out. Uh, I was perfectly willing to change. And uh, I'm a firm believer that having a coffee with Steve Lehman was much better than an email. And so um, thinking past, uh, you know, knowing your audience, it, it's more of having coffee with the audience, eating lunch with the audience, um, and hearing them in a much more candid way uh, when there isn't any pressure on. So we don't have to worry about uh, the incredible acceleration of what happens during a crisis. So if it was me, I was trying to have a better relationship uh, with the response community as an academic. Um, I'd make Exxon or API uh, buy us lunch every day. <laughs> and, you know, that every culture is a different stakeholder. And, you know, we want to think about, you know, when I think about different stakeholders, I think about what their time scales are, uh, how they, you know, where is certainty in their realm? What is the risk and what is the reward? So 18 years later, um, after the um, Bouchard 120 oil spill and uh, lots of opportunities, super lucky, met a lot of folks, learned a lot of things. Um, Deepwater Horizon for me was completely, you know, a changing in my life. Um, and I would say one of the benefits is just how many people I got to meet and know and, you know, how many friends I got to meet. Um, you, know, the, you know, my wife calls me before and after Deepwater Horizon. That's how she refers it to me. And I, I tend to think it might be better. I'm better now. <laughs> uh, but Steve probably has a play in there too. So uh, I'm fast forward. I, I'm going to talk for another five or six minutes uh, oh, um, about the Express Pearl. Um, and this is a cargo ship. Um, and uh, kind of the science and, and, and my role and what I did uh, with thinking about whether or not Steve would be, you know, would Steve call me a guerrilla geochemist? Express Pearl was a cargo ship laden with lots of different chemicals, polymers and resins, nitric acid, elemental sulfur. It um, left Qatar and, um, no, 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 UAE on May 10th, um, started to have a problem. Uh, noticed that it was leaking uh, nitric acid on the ship. Um, a couple of days, I can't remember right now. Um, a couple of days before May 20th, I um, was trying to find a place to, to tie up. And um, the Sri Lankans, uh, you know, said you can tie up off offshore. We'll try to figure out how we can help you. And that nitric acid um, leak became a fire on the ship. And um, it was a terrible time. And uh, one of the cargoes on that ship was small little pieces of plastic, noodles, you know, these uh, pieces of plastic that are pre-production plastics that, you know, you'd use for um, raw material, just a raw material. And uh, very early on, um, these pieces of pre-production plastic, these noodles started to show up on the beach to the point where 75% of the Sri Lankan coastline was covered with noodles, uh, whether they were more standard or whether or not they were burnt across a continuum of different burntness. Um, so early on, um, I got a phone call uh, from one of my closest friends, uh, Lahini Alohari at Scripps. And she said, uh, I have a really close friend of mine, Asha DeVos, who's in Sri Lanka. Um, could you talk to her about things that we should, you know, th there's fuel oil on the ship, the underway fuel, there's other chemicals. Uh, the nitric acid, the plastic. Uh, could you just give her some input? She, she's a really talented scientist, a conservationist who uh, has her own uh, NGO called Ocean Swell. And she was very keen to communicate solid science. And um, so I was, I was hard bit to actually provide that science that could uh, you know, give knowledge, uh, but not amplify concerns or fears. 
And, um, you know, one of the things that became very clear to me uh, when I was speaking to uh, not necessarily Asha, but other folks uh, and the press and, and kind of the perception about uh, the Express Pearl, you know, in May 21, was this idea that, you know, an oil spill or another release is just, you know, it's, you know, you're just titrating a pollutant into a beaker or a round bottom flask in this case. And I was really trying to drive home the reality of this event that, uh, you know, you, you had, there were concerns of acid rain um, from all the burning of materials. Um, this was a ship that was sunk uh, during the seasonal monsoon with six foot seas, uh, releasing uh, nitric acid in uh, a cargo just loaded with many more chemicals that had not been released. You know, that alone just underscores the challenges that the response community faced with the Express Pearl. Of course, then you can add the pandemic. Um, there's no doubt that this was a huge challenge. And I will say the Sri Lankans, I think, did fantastic uh, responding to it. So anyways, our relationship, my relationship with uh, Asha, who's on the other side of the world in Sri Lanka, um, I was talking to her about what chemicals would, would persist, uh, likelihood of injury. I uh, talked about a lot of things that I was trying to do to give her information, but the, that was pretty clean and clear. Asha started showing me pictures uh, on the beach that she was collecting not too far from where she lived. And she was showing me these pieces of plastic that was, that was coming from the Express Pearl. Some of them looked pretty pristine and others looked like, um, looked not like plastic anymore. And they were black and they were dark. And it, it came clear to me that uh, I asked her, I was like, can you send me some of these samples? And I was thinking about, uh, I was kind of thinking about from a response community, um, that this wasn't a single entity, that the neural spill here, that you know, looking at these images that she had sent to me, that it's entirely possible that some of the burnt nurdles would not be seen, or maybe they would transport differently. And um, so she sent me some samples. They came to my lab on June 11th. Um, I was kind of following uh, also the oil, um, following the following the, some really great work that uh, ITOF was uh, putting up, and. Um, Got in contact uh, through Asha with Connor Bolas at ITOF, who's boots on the ground there. And we started to exchange emails and I was trying to give him the knowledge that we had and things that we were thinking about. And it was an incredibly fruitful exchange. Um, and then we were able within uh, about two weeks of getting the samples, we made a fact sheet uh, of what we knew. Um, my, my lab group and other, and other folks in Woods Hole and other colleagues from our world we put together a fact sheet and we explained um, what we learned and what are the things that we were thinking about and um, uh, what, you know, what might be different. And we were trying to frame this as, um, here's the information that other folks should know about. And uh, you, know, you should be thinking about these and, and using that in your own calculus. One of the big issues that was coming up at that time was that there were all the nurdle spills um, that had happened and there was uh, a lot of folks were um, arguing while we were holding these samples and the burnt ones were brittle. Like you actually could uh, make them much smaller and finer uh, than the, the non ones, the ones that weren't burnt, like the ones that were uh, um, released here. Um, and they were also all recognized as non-hazardous. Um, and there was a, you know, there were folks in the Sri Lankan government that were saying a nurdle is a nurdle. When we were looking at that data, we didn't think that, um, that uh, that might be the case. And that was one of our big drivers was to provide information uh, to the response community and the people that um, Sri Lankan government and the media that uh, this might be a bigger challenging issue and to think about it, not necessarily do it, but we provided recommendations. And, you know, we were following the neural spill, neural release, and we got these samples that look like this. And, um, when we first started analyzing these samples, maybe, so we got the samples on June 11th. So between June 11th and June 23rd, we started analyzing these samples with a, a bunch of different colleagues. First thing we did was weigh them. And uh, we measured their, you know, kind of their um, the scale in terms of, you know, width and thickness and whether or not, uh, you know, the circularity and, you know, 
nothing fancy, but it was very clear that that just the simple weight of the that the burnt plastics had it were much smaller. They could even be much bigger. They had different colors, uh, different sizes. It was clear that this was really important information that needed to be translated. We were th seeing things like this, um, a piece of the plastic that were very different, and uh, I thought were useful to the response community. And I was beating a drum to a lot of my colleagues that this is the type of information that the response community should know about. That you know that we had an opportunity in our lab where it wasn't so chaotic. We had the infrastructure to do this work. And uh, I was um, unbelievable images. Not one of these pieces of neurons looks the same. Here's a burnt one that kind of swallowed up uh, uh, unburnt one. And one of my colleagues, as I was talking about why we needed to communicate these results in a clear way, was pretty incredulous. Um, her point was, this is some very cutting edge. And that uh, uh, the science of uh, using a ruler in a balance is not worth communicating. And to me, this was a big disconnect um, and really kind of a life lesson that I, I was able to explain to this person about the science and the knowledge that the response community needs versus what we need to get tenure. And that I thought that size and shape would be useful for, to be passing along in a clean, clear way um, that was um, useful and that we didn't need fancy equipment. Um, at, the point, at that moment, pretty chromatograms uh, were not actionable information, whereas size, shape, distribution, color, these were types of information that I thought was valuable to the response committee. And I was just lucky. You know, this, I was lucky to hang around folks like Steve Lehman and others and appreciate that disconnect and not revisiting that mistake I had made in 2003, where I told my audience, about cutting edge stuff. In reality, I probably given, could have given more discussion about um, the oil that was there and actually actually truly tell them that it wasn't going to be another West Palm spill, um, that that consultant was right. you know, And I knew that, but I could have made a, a stronger case there. And uh, instead of telling them all the cool stuff that I was going to do in three or four years later. Um, so we put this fact sheet together and we put out very clear ways about color and shape and size and how that might affect the fate and the transport and how that might affect um, you know, cleanups. It was entirely possible that when we spoke to a physical oceanographer, a fluid mechanic, uh, um, a woman named Michelle DiBendetto at, at UW in Seattle, um, she was showing that the transport would be much different. That it was entirely possible that some of the burnt plastics were not gonna come up on the shore uh, because their size and their shape had changed. And uh, so we put this, fact sheet together. State Department asked me to talk about this on July 1. And I spent a lot of time during that talk. Um, and it was mostly geared to the, the media. So this, the US State Department asked me to kind of brief to the media about how science works during a crisis. And I spent a lot of time talking about recovery and about the chaos and about the challenges that you face during a response. And that, you know, there's many different pieces and pies and I was really driving home this concept, you know, um, and in some respects, this is me also defending science during the COVID as well, that science is an infinite jigsaw puzzle and that we change and it's never ending and you can work on different pieces and, you know, we just don't work fast. So, if, you know, some things are going to change and we have to accept that as, as, a, as moving forward as opposed to it being a loss, that things change, but that usually means a good thing uh, for us, but it, when things change, we, it looks like we change our mind to other stakeholders, it, it looks like a failure. Um, and I spent a lot of time talking about that. So I'm just tying up right here. Uh, ship's still there. And most of the cargo is still there. Um, so this is still a threat that still exists. And uh, we were lucky to uh, publish our, our first paper on this. And um, I was very keen to get this paper out and, and um, in part because I wanted to publish a paper during an ongoing response. And I thought that um, providing our information uh, in a way that was peer reviewed might be useful, um, a useful tool to other players to show that the data was there and available uh, to make the most well-informed decisions and, and to, to you know, lessen damages.
put together this kind of cartoon and things that we're thinking about. And uh, we continue to this day, I, one of my postdocs, Brian James and I continue to work in exchange with Connor and other folks at ITOF. One of the things that we're starting to see is that plain old nurdle, plain old piece of plastic um, on May 25th, a couple of days, you know, fire catches on and 10 miles away, um, you go from pristine nurdles to pieces of plastic that have all these different sizes and shapes. Uh, and just really underscoring um, the challenges and about how this beast, this plastic, our enemy changed. And it, and it became clear that the science at this point may not be as directed towards maybe the response, but more about what can you learn from this uninvited guest um, on a grander, more global scale. Um, there's a lot of plastic that gets burnt. Uh, pyroplastic, whether for waste incineration and, and other places. And, and we thought that this was an opportunity um, uh, to have a time stamp on a burnt piece of plastic and start thinking about it in the long term. And, you know, I think that's one of the really fun parts of uh, uh, my career is being able to be involved in a response and provide information and then pivot to thinking about that uh, more kind of a basic science or maybe, you know, an interest on a much grander scale than the, the local area of this response. Now, just pivoting to all you folks know, I mean, this um, shipping containers are all over the world. And, um, you know, if you look at the, um, you see what's on the cargo of the Express Pearl, um, you start to appreciate just how complex uh, these different materials are and uh, the chemicals that, that folks would be facing during a response. And um, I think it's a tough thing that's, you know, I, I'm hoping that there are any more and there are no accidents, but I think if they happen, they're going to be challenging because um, you know, you're gonna have to be outside the box. I think that at least in the United States, I think we're well positioned. I think there's a lot of talented folks that can use the knowledge gained from an oil spill to respond to whether it's pieces of plastic or hydrogen peroxide you know, there's kind of a, a knowledge base that uh, every chemical has a different personality, and has a different threat in the short term and the long term. So just tying up is my last slide. You know, the um, thing I learned in, in 18 years is that first impressions can be wrong. You know, uh, coffee, or in this case, Steve was, you know, sitting at a bar before dinner, uh, really understanding and, and kind of respecting. You don't have to agree with other stakeholders and players, but you do, you know, you would be better off if you had an understanding and respect for them. And, you know, we're still working on this express pearl, but I think it's a really tough um, response. And, you know, we're still trying to get some idea of mass balance and trying to figure out where all these burnt plastics are and wh what kind of potential injury they are in the short term and the long term, and how that, um, that you know, that pre-exposure of fire, how does it dictate its long-term fate? And I, I think that the Express Pearl is a, a really um, powerful and unfortunate example about um, the challenges that the response community faces for cargo vessels and just how diverse of a product that they are carrying and it's unfortunate that they release. So yeah, I'm super lucky. I'm uh, thanking a ton of people here. And uh, once again, um, thanking uh, Tim and Lynn for inviting me. And uh, I put my email up earlier at the first slide. Uh, if you have any feedback, you know, shoot me an email. Um, happy to talk. I'm not very good at responding to emails. So if you don't hear from me, just respond to me again and say you promised you would respond. So, anyways, uh, thanks, Tim. And I'm all set. Oh, Chris, that's that's that was perfect, right? The, so, what I'm trying to do with this webinar series is get perspectives from different groups, and so we can all kind kind of come to an understanding of what's kind of some of the motivators for how we think and act. And, and so this talk has really hit the head, hit it right on the nail there. So I, I appreciate it. I want to mention, I got a, <laughs> I got a text message from Steve Lehman. He's listening, by the oh way. Oh my God. And hey so I'm Steve, glad, how's it going? I'm glad, I'm glad you turned around the rumpled pants, terrible talk to, you know, your full of respect, respect for him before you finish oh, no, that. Steve's, uh, Steve's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So as Steve's comment was, uh, the universe, it's a universal truth. Drinking helps everything. <laughs> comments on your, your, your bar your bar room uh meeting yeah. um
So while we're trying to get, we're getting questions coming in, let me just mention something and it kind of follows on this thing here, right? It's, it's, it's really struck me, uh, I don't know, about four or five years ago, I was in an RT6 meeting in, in Dow, outside of Dallas. And in Atkins, so the RT6 meeting is, is usually almost completely populated. Those meetings have 40 or 50 people and they're all really intimately involved in the response. And then occasionally we'll get an academic to come in. And uh, about four years ago, an academic came in and said, um, you know, he was said, trying to describe, well, how do we get academics more involved in the response side of things? And it struck me when he was talking that what he's suggesting is never going to work. And it's kind of this, what you described here, right? He has a completely different reward system. And at that meeting was the, one of the coordinators of the RT6 meetings um, was retiring. And, and it struck me that the guy who was retiring, he'd been to every meeting I'd been, right? He'd been to every one of them. He went to every meeting. Well, why did he go to every meeting? Because his boss expected him to be at every meeting. If he didn't go to every meeting, his reward system would, would, would slow down, right? And he wouldn't get, he would have problems. And the academic was not only at that one meeting, right? I've been to a few meetings because my boss expects me to be at meetings like that. And, and his boss didn't expect him to be at meetings because his reward system is what you said, right? Your, your reward is getting tenure, publishing papers, um, getting grants, you know, and influencing things. And it's not attending our RT6 meetings because it's not likely that any of those, attending that meeting is going to influence your ability to get grant money, your ability to write papers and things. Yeah, like for that. the most part, that's true. Yeah. So, so we need to have the, we need to understand each other's, what drives each other's, you know, actions. And, and that's a kind of a fundamental difference is that the responders are there. You know, Steve wants to make what he knows is going to be bad, less bad, right? And, and he can't wait, as you said, he can't wait a week for the answer, right? He has to have the nurdles are this shape and this shape, right? Look for these things, right? And then make your decisions, right? Based on this fundamental information that I can give you right now. If you told him 10 weeks later that this is how the nurdles are going to look after a certain, it doesn't help, right? It doesn't do anything. So understanding those different perspectives are, is really important. And so I just wanted to add that you and I talked about this, Chris, and I wanted to mention it to the group that I think one of the ways we need to, in the United States at least, is we need to figure out how to get an oil spill response center of excellence funded with some long-term funding. And I mentioned how there's some NSF funding that comes around every, every few years. Um, and so we need to, as a group, I think a community, we need to have academics and the response community that sit in this oil spill response center of excellence that's doing consistent research over long, peri long periods of time so we keep the academic side and the response side in kind of the same under the same roof so they can communicate with each other but there's we 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 meet the what drives the academic side of this research and response field in the business for for longer periods of time. And so they don't just hop into the business after a big spill when there's a lot of funding. And then they go on to other things because that's what you have to do uh, when you're an academic, when there's not, when there's not research funding. You know, so, it can be, it's mutually beneficial. I mean, you know, the, we could talk about this forever and stuff like that. Um, you know, um, defending a scientist, you know, we're trying to find interesting cases. We're trying to learn how the work, world works. And oil spills are unbelievable. You can never get funded or, uh, or permission to you know, uh, to do an oil spill. I mean, oil oil spill is just a rapid release of highly reduced carbon in a coastal environment. Um, yeah. So you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's not that it's not, you know a lot of academics get kind of beat up or you know um, from other folks, uh, but they don't appreciate exactly what our jobs are and that we do not do well with uncertainty. Um, yeah. We don't like to live in the seventies. Seventy does not get you tenure. Yeah, no. I mean, it's, so it's a. I I would say that the center of center of excellence uh, starts off with trust and respect and appreciation, and, and then you know having um, ideas about how you can have funded projects that uh, you know hit the list of what uh, helps you out, but also is stimulating and moves the scientific field forward. And there's no shortage of those ideas. Yeah. So I I think we should continue to talk about that offline. Yeah. If yeah, people yeah, yeah. on this call have some thoughts on how, you know, what some funding sources is, because I think 
I, I, I have a benefit being in, we're correct on mobile and I'm on the research side of the corporation, but I also get to speak whenever I want to, to, to the responders. And the, so the researchers and the responders that get their hands dirty need to communicate consistently. Enough. And we need to figure out how to understand what motivates these different groups to make sure that they do these consistent communications. And so somehow um, I think going in the future, we need to figure out how to do that. So we, we can talk about that. Um, sure talk about that um, offline. Um, so we're getting quite a number of questions here. So why don't I just start going going through the questions and Lynn, help me out if I, if I miss something because sometimes this is a little confusing in Zoom. But the first question is, Chris, because of the nature of how science works, as you mentioned, it is possible to skew the science or the science results or findings to support a predetermined agenda or desired outcome. I'm sure we've all seen that to some extent. Integrity is certainly a high order asset that academic and other scientists must embrace to build trust and confidence with the response community. Any thoughts on this is the question. Uh, couldn't say any better. I mean, you know, the thing that we have to remember is that for the most part, uh, we can say no. I mean, it's hard to say it, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, leaving the ivory tower is super risky. Um, and it frustrates me sometimes when senior administration and academia uh, encourage us to be, you know, more involved, but, um, but they don't necessarily have your back when things go a little sideways. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a tough place. And I, I would tell people to move carefully uh, for these very reasons. We're not going to change academia that fast. Yeah. It's a risk. Um, and that's it. I totally agree with that point. Yeah, just one of the challenges I see is that, uh, you know, someone will publish some papers and it'll get a lot of recognition. It'll a cover of a journal. And then a, a couple of years later, there's additional research that shows that maybe those conclusions weren't on completely on target, at least. And there is it's just human nature. It's to stick by your guns on those conclusions, right? Especially when you've got a lot of recognition and, and your reputation can be to some extent at stake. And so it's, it's hard to turn um, when new science kind of, not if it completely refutes your, your conclusions, it's easy to turn. But when it, when it partly does, it's sometimes people stay by their, you know, stick their guns longer than they should. And it's quite, it's quite challenging sometimes. And there's a huge latency. Too, right? I mean, uh, for the, I mean, I'm, I'm not a responder, but the response community cannot live off one paper to suddenly change their whole mechanism. Um, you know, you know, I don't know when you folks make a decision about how you might pivot off, but it can't be just one paper. Uh, yeah. It's not financially wise. It's not, you're going against so much experience. I don't know when you pivot, uh, but that's something I tell scientists all the time is that there might be a better absorbent out there, but if it's just 2% better than what they have on every warehouse in the coastline, they're not gonna change. Um, it's not worth it from the potential failure when you have all this pre-existing knowledge about what's already there. And that's a huge challenge for scientists to appreciate. Yes. Um, that, that challenge that, yeah, science moves forward, but there <laughs> needs to be a huge amount of base, knowledge base before you can change things. Not because of hesitance, but simply based on practicality. Yeah, that's that, that's exactly right. Right, we have stockpile. The industry has stockpile huge stockpiles that cost millions and millions of dollars, and we're not they're not going to be abandoned for an incremental advance in in a, in the technology that we're using or a, or a new tech. It's got to be a step change advance yeah. to to some extent for it to really be read to be adopted in a, in any time of any any time frame that's, that's meaningful actually. Yeah. Okay, let me go to the next question. Thank So Chris, thanks for the wonderful observations, your humility and the nod to the work of the NOAA SSCs. You're one of the academics who's prepared to respond to oil spills shortly after they occur. Over the years, we have tried to find ways to keep academics and NGOs involved in preparedness for spill. Can you comment on ways acad academicians, I'm saying that wrong, can be prepared to respond, become involved in enriching spill response science and the NERDA process? You know, I would have, um, uh, you know, like it or not, I've seen emails where sometimes we feel, the academic community feel like we're uh, fair-weathered friends. And if we don't deliver, then we're suddenly discounted. Um, 
you know, um, I'm not that smart, but what I would say is um, having folks like the SSSCs and other folks actually being boots on the ground and finding folks who, you know, you know, exactly this, not exchanging business cards at a crisis. Um, I, you know, you guys have a huge load of materials and work, but, you know, to me, I think you could go a long way by visiting schools and not necessarily giving a canned lecture. And I'm not knocking you guys at all, but actually having a lecture about, you know, the anthropology, about the culture and the language and things like that. I think that is where I'd start, um, is really truly explaining, you know, what our value systems are. Um, but somebody's going to give up the time, you know, I mean, you guys are responding all the time, but at the end of the day, uh, the email assault of, of these things, it just doesn't work. You know, we move so slowly and our lives are so planned out. My first bet is, is to get people in a room, don't have a, you know, have an agenda. Don't try to do it at a seminar series or an international meeting. Two people are too distracted, have these types of relationships that, uh, people feel like they have a level of trust and respect. And that is the goal, not to talk about the science. I'd actually say the first goal is actually, you know, exchanging business cards. Okay, no, great. Um, listen, I'm not mentioning people's names on these questions, although I see these names and questions. Hey, tell them if they want. Yeah, tell them if they, they're cool. I'd love to say hi to whoever it is, so. <laughs> well, the problem is that we have these <laughs> privacy protocols and if oh, I miss, yeah, 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 yeah. Guy, right. yeah, this API thing, and I need to get a document from them. Um, so oh, I yeah, apologize for keeping yeah. this kind of incognito, but uh, I got a comment here. Nice talk, Chris. I had a very similar experience with Steve Lehman early in my career that shifted my understanding on the importance of seeing things from perspectives other than my own. I'll tell you, my, my, when I first, so I'm going to say just the opposite about your first interaction with Steve and his presentation. I, in 2006, I gave a talk. At a, at a workshop in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Steve was there. And I think I talked right after him. And I just started into the oil spill business and I had all these kind of ideas on how we improve things. And I was gonna talk about some of those things. And I remember Steve got up before me and spoke. And Steve has a much kind of stronger voice, right? He should be a, he should be a radio, um, you know, a oh, disc jockey yeah. or something because he's got this kind of strong, deep, authoritative voice. And he went up and gave such a really good, a really good talk, I thought, um, that it kind of threw me off guard because I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be the, you know, the, the keynote speaker here because I'm doing all this great um, work. And uh, so rumpled jeans and, and maybe he got more sleep for, before he gave that talk, but I had kind of the completely. And in fact, it, it threw me, it threw me off guard because I'm like, ah, how do I compete with, with somebody who could speak like that? And I remember thinking that specifically. Okay. Here we go. Chris, any thoughts on academics hey, interaction? No. Go ahead. No, but I immediately come to mind that uh, the SSSCs and other response communities are super slant right now. So uh, I think that uh, maybe the powers that be hire folks like Ed Levine and Steve and be the ambassadors to try to explain how the world works. So I don't know if I'm not trying to get Steve a side hustle, but I think that might be a fit. Um, yeah, that's yeah. another one of the things I think is that the the, res the organizations that have resources for funding oil spill response research need to have a set of kind of go-to consultants that act as liaisons between the people that write proposals and start doing research and the, the fundies, right? We need, we need the groups that have the resources to rely on some of the people that have got their hands dirty and Steve Lehman and Ed Levine and others Mm -hmm. have been doing it for a long they've got their hands dirty for a long time so they're going to know you know they're going to know immediately if this is a good idea or not right and and so they need to be they need to be there needs to be a set of consultants that help support some of this uh even propose even requests writing requests for proposals right and, and I, I think i think the expertise that those guys have could be could be utilized uh more than it is is now for for the for the research side of things sure. um Okay, Chris, any thoughts on academic interaction with the press? It strikes me that the press is looking for a big story and tend to spin what they are told. And that can give academics attention, even if the results not, are not really interpreted quite correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's a semester long class. Um, at the end of the day, um, 
you don't feel comfortable having those interviews, don't do it. Um, if you're not quite sure about giving an interview, I would get my uh, press liaison officer at my university to sit with me um, or have another friend uh, sit in on a Zoom meeting. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's challenging. You know, um, you know even thinking about making mistakes, you know, the media can make a mistake and now it, it's completely forgotten. You know, maybe they put an, an errata in the New York Times the next day. You make a mistake in academia, that don't go away <clears throat> sometimes. So I do think that this is another aspect of risk and how do you minimize risk? Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you have to communicate to scientists that it is tricky. Um, and I think sometimes you just have to say no, uh, like it or not. Um, I think it's really hard. Uh, it's not easy. And, they, you know, there is no expectation that it should be easy. <laughs> You know, like, you know, you don't have, not every culture and different stakeholder has to mesh perfectly. You might be just willing to accept the fact that sometimes they just don't work well or that, you know, might work for others. And, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah, I'll tell you an insight. So for anyone at ExxonMobil to give, a, to give an interview to the press, which is, a, you know, something that you don't do just off, cuff, off the cuff, but you have to have, take media training yeah. And you don't, you know, you, you don't really realize how your thinking changes when there's, so in the media training, you do some actual, and you know, they're all staged and everything's fake. Yeah. But when you have a microphone in front of you and they'll bring somebody out with a camera and put it in your face. And even in the media training, how you react to that is just striking, right? It, the pressure and the difference of that. And that's what you knowing that you're in a, in a course where it, at the end, nobody's going to be listening to you other than yourself. And you can, I mean, I have stories from the media training about some of the people I took it with that I tell at parties because they were so ridiculous. I tell at parties that people don't even know them, right? Because some of the ways they acted when the camera went on and the lights went on and there was a microphone in their face, even though it wasn't. So the yeah. pressure of that interaction is something that's just a new animal that you, if you haven't been exposed to it, even in something like media training, I think you might not even be able to think straightly, or you might say things that you wish you hadn't said because you just not, you're not yourself until you get accustomed to it. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges academia has is that somewhere or another, folks taking a three hour workshop and one five minute uh, dry run with a reporter giving you a few in, uh, 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 stamps you as prepared. Yep. And uh, you know, if you wanna get good in anything in this world, I'm not sure, you need 10,000 hours like Malcolm Gladwell, but a three hour workshop on how to communicate to the press is that's just an appreciation. That's not uh, a certificate of, of going for it. And I think, you know, what I try to do when I give interviews now uh, is I have my grad students and postdocs uh, on the Zoom meetings and I have them listen. Um, sometimes I might ask them a question. For, for the most part, I ask the re reporter, can, uh, can this person listen in? And then after the interview, I, I asked him to write a couple paragraphs about what their take was of the interview. And then um, once the piece gets published, I have them write a couple more sentences about the outcome of the piece and have that um, student or postdoc send it to both to the scientist and to the reporter. And I think those are the places where you make these teachable moments. I feel so bad for the, so many folks who get sit up in the front of the room and they have to do this dry run for three minutes. And it is so embarrassing. And I think it's like the worst way to train people. Uh, if that's your three hour training and, and 10 or 20 minutes of it is sitting in front of a camera, that is not the way to do it. There's not a way to embrace people. It's not a way to engage people. And it's not a good way to make them feel good about themselves. Uh, if you're gonna go and do media training, let's, let's empower these people. Let's train them. Let's make them feel good about themselves and not make it this embarrassing event, which I've seen so many times and my heart goes out to people. Yeah. 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 No, what media training taught me is that I suck at talking to the media, right? And, the only way <laughs> that, right? and, and it, it does, it, it makes you very clearly understand that and right. Not have this false hope that you are good at it. Um, but it, it, it reinforces that you, you, it's a, it's a skill and you have to do it to be often to become come from by in some way or another, right? Even just speaking in front of people more often is like, yeah. all right, I'm not gonna say this next person's name, but he has a comment for you. It says, from a government hack to a guerrilla geochemist. Great yes. talk, my friend. <laughs> Explaining the complex is difficult and you're good at it. 50% certainty day is better than 90% certainty in two weeks in the response community. So there you go. 
All right, here's another one. Thank you, Chris. I'm connecting with my local city folks regarding public awareness of response during incidents, i.e. the oil trains passing through Edmonds. You gave me a lot of thought, another comment. Um, let's see, from the response standpoint, we always deserve the right to be smarter later, to quote Jerry Galt. All right, and last, last comment here. So if there's, we still have a little bit of time if there's any other question. Excellent session, thanks um, for the invitation. Let me, hey, let me ask you, so I, I wrote this down in case our questions didn't come through, but since we have a couple more minutes, it would be great if you summarize what I mentioned at the beginning, right? The, the, what the message, the key message was you gave to the National Academy of Science regarding, and it's kind of group psychology and how, how, yeah. that, how that group, the National Academy of Science, I mean, you were, you were um, lobbying again with them to try to get them to put a psychologist or a psychologist yeah. on, that, on that committee, which I think was something that I hadn't thought of um, until then. But when you think about groupthink and how when the media says something and it's, it's not necessarily accurate, but it really influences the psychology. And then that from a big spill like the Deepwater Horizon, that misinformation that comes out of this media report and the guy doesn't really know exactly what he's saying. He's trying to take the worst case scenario and the sky is falling and how that perspective turns to this group psychology for the public. And then that influences the politicians and it comes back down and has influence on the on response decision is just not the way to, you know, that's not the right cycle for decision making, obviously. So I know you had some some really good. Well, I totally agree. I, I honestly, I remember that talk, but I do think that we have to think about putting a lot of this, you know, like it or not, people think about oil spills and they think about dolphins. Uh, I think about oil spills, I think about people. Um, you know, I think that's how we want to start framing things. Uh, obviously, we want to make the ocean cleaner and so. But at the end of the day, to me, the goal is is how do we make people's lives and livelihoods and what they value better off. And if you frame it like that. Uh, instead of cleaning oil off a rock, which you need to do. I think uh, that works sometimes. Um, I would say a psychologist, uh, sometimes folks think of them as spin doctors, but I do think that the human component about what matters to people, that when an oil hits the beach and that's where they got married, or that's where they, you know, these things matter, you know. Um, and that is one thing I learned from Deepwater Horizon. I walked the beaches from, uh, uh, you know, from, Pensacola Beach all the way to, to Fushan. Uh, and, you know, the thing you learned the most is that you, we have, I have no idea the impact that spills have on people. Um, and, you know, maybe that's another aspect of training. I'm not sure how you could do it, is to add the human component of the people who actually been affected about an interview or, you know, how did that change? And, you know, I saw so-and-so's put this on the news. How does that affect them? You know, my advice to scientists is to start local. Uh, you know, often we want to go and, and go to Washington, D.C. and bang on the doors. Uh, my advice to the scientists is to go have coffee with uh, maybe your environmental police or maybe the Coast Guard's based by or, or even go and talk to the local reporters uh, about their jobs. Um, so start local. It's a much better place uh, to cut your teeth. Or even go see the theater department and the communications department in your own school. Uh, if you're going to be an interview, I make friends with somebody in, in the journalism school and uh, have them sit in on your interviews. Yep. Yeah, no, no. It's, you know, having eyeballs on you and then a camera and a light yeah. is yeah. changes how you react, that's for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so the, 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 the way to get around that is to do it as often as possible, right, under, yeah. you know, when it's not an emergency. Looks like we have one, well, there's something, something else coming up, but we have one less comment here and I'm not sure what he's responding to. Um, I was thinking the opposite problem, folks like the attention, which is, I think I agree with that. Oh, and that's yeah. maybe more important than the message being properly communicated to them. Sometimes it, not even direct interviews, but papers results are misinterpreted. And I, 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 I certainly understand that. The one paper doesn't change the whole thing is the, is the problem we need to we need to be sure because one of the things I talk about a lot is how it's a challenge to take beaker and basin tests and then extrapolate those to what happens in the real world because of just a huge amount of constraints and bias that happens in a beaker yeah. compared to what happens yeah. in the ocean. Well, you know, a lot of this is out of our, our control, right? I mean, listen, we're going to write great papers. They're going to get peer reviewed. They're going to get published. You know, we can't control the narrative. We can do our best, but you know. Uh, 
a lot of scientists get beat up a little because they write a paper, but they're just trying to move science forward. And it's incremental and it goes one step back and then two steps forward. And, you know, there are things, this world, we live in an imperfect world. And uh, we have to accept the fact that all these different stakeholders in the media, you know, sometimes they want to amplify it to sell more newspapers. And it's unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, peer review papers move the ball forward and we have to keep doing that. Um, but just to remind everybody, there is no expectation that this has to be the most harmonious thing. We just have to try to be as meshed as possible um, to have as good of an outcome so that we can make the people who are impacted better off. Yeah, I, I don't think there's solutions to these problems, but understanding that these are problems, like understanding that the beaker is not the real world, right? And then when you write, make conclusions about your beaker tests, you should try to couch them in what, you know, your expectations for the real world or that, yeah. you know, academics have this different set of drivers and you're never going to get them to come to each RRT6 meeting, right? Yeah. Because they're not paid to be there and their boss doesn't expect them, to, right? Understanding those different perspectives is, you know, you may not, there may not be a solution to some of these things, but understanding them so you can think about them when you're trying to make decisions is important. You know, I, I recognize your point about environmentally relevant and that what happens in a beacon may not be the same as the coastline. Uh, but, you know, that gives some insight. You know, is it transferable all the time? No, but I think a lot of my colleagues in the peer review are trying their best to move the ball forward. You know, perhaps maybe they want to underscore the point that maybe that is not completely uh, relevant, but I do think it shines light on trying to solve the problem. And I do think that's a big disconnect. And I think the environmental relevance and that translation gets lost, not necessarily with the scientists, but in between. It gets, you know, there's a little bit of a black box that sometimes things get a little lost. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're trying our best, you know, and oh, we have to I, somehow live together. So. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't. No, 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 I understand. You got to do beaker tests. Yeah, right? yeah, you got to start templates. But that the understanding of how the, you know, what the biases are in these beaker yeah, tests yeah. needs and, to be you know, highlighted in some papers better than it is. Yeah, well, I mean, on the flip side, uh, you know, it, um, it's not always practical to try to do it in the real world. Who's going to take, if you have limited assets in theater, who's going to take one of your best boats and some of your more co uh, competent people with limited resources and take a scientist out to collect some water? And at yeah. the end of the day, we're trying our best because we don't necessarily have access. But at the same time, Responders, you know, they got to solve the problem right now. So, you yeah, know, that's the disconnect. We're trying our best and, you know, but yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if you could do that, right, it's, it's not, it doesn't replace the beaker yeah. test. You, you're trying to do controlled experiments and your, yeah, you know, yeah, your yeah. emergency spill is not a controlled experiment. So yeah. you can't change one variable at a time. And even if, if we could have just the luxury of doing field releases, it still wouldn't displace yeah. uh, those things because you still can't control Mother Nature when you're doing the field releases. Yeah. So there has to be, you know, it'd be great if we could do more kind of controlled field experiments. Yeah. I don't think yeah. that's happen anytime in the future. So we have the emergencies where we can try to do some things, but the, the lab tests are going to be the way to do science, right? Yeah. Uh, lab and, and basin tests as a way to do science, but there, there certainly needs to be caveats on before the extrapolation goes very far. Um, listen, we're right at our, our time limit here. Um, we have, uh, yeah, no more questions. So awesome. listen, Chris, once again, I, I really appreciate yeah. um, you taking the time to do this. I know you put a lot of thought into those slides sure. and I can tell that because what you showed us um, a few days ago is yeah. like, been thinking about it in the last few days even because it's, yeah. it's more to something um even better than what you showed us a, a few days ago so I, I appreciate the time and effort um to do this um and because we're i'm not you're not getting compensated other than i'm gonna give, buy you a beer next time we're in durham or something <laughs> hey uh anybody wants to slide back and use any of these slides as they see fit uh just give me a holler you can have them you know if it moves the ball forward go for it Okay. Uh, just don't do the one with Steve and Rumpel jeans. We don't want to have it taken out of context. Well, he says he's now figured out how to use the, an iron. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He has pleated jeans now. Um, <laughs> so great. All right. So now, um, yeah, I'm going to let her go. Just I'll reiterate what Lynn said. I was hoping that we could announce who our speaker was next year. We have a couple next month. We have a couple people that are kind of in the books here, maybe. Um, and so we'll send out an email once we firm that up. If we don't, we'll skip a month and we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene in what, March, in April, I guess. 